Well, hello again. Welcome back to Peak Human. I'm Brian Sanders. Make sure to start back at episode one. Go back and listen to all the great episodes, share with family and friends, and of course, leave us a review on iTunes or any other podcast app that really helps. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Zoe Harcomb. I had her back on the show a long time ago. She is excellent, fantastic, such a great conversation the first time and even better this time. People love that episode and I think they're gonna love this one even more. We talk about a lot of interesting stuff. I'll, I'll say interesting, I don't wanna sound off the alarms. We get into some edgy stuff in the second half and I think people will really enjoy her take. She's over in the UK, she's fighting the good fight. She's also fighting the good fight in nutrition. She has done her PhD on the dietary guidelines and how bogus they are. So before I get on to more about her, I have a few updates. Got some big news. If you're in Austin, this will be even bigger news. I'm getting close to signing a lease on a property here in East Austin for nose to tail headquarters for a community center for the Sapien Wellness Health Everything Event Center. So Yes, we would have nose to tail products, we would have nose to tail food, we would have events, we would have a gym space, we have co-working space, we have indoor, outdoor, we have sauna, cold plunge, barbecue, fire pit, we have it all. This is the ultimate ancestral health center. We will be having events all throughout the week, events on the weekend, distributing meat, not having to ship it out to people. You can get in person, get all the primal ground beef from nose to tail with the organs mixed in, get the low pufa pork and chicken, get all the stuff, all the pasture raised, wild crafted, organic, everything, top of the line stuff. Instead of getting it through the mail, you can get it from us, we can ship it out. We're working with my friend as well to use an app to get it out to people with very quick delivery. So lots of updates there. If you wanna be a part of this, please email me. You can email me at hi at foodlies.org, just hi at foodlies.org. Any way you wanna get involved, we're looking for investors all the way down to just members. If you wanna pre-order your membership for a year, we have discounts. We're looking for founding partners, we're looking for people to help build this out. We're looking for anyone who wants to get involved and be part of this amazing community we have in Austin. Even if you're not in Austin, there may be some way to get involved. Just email me, hi at foodlies.org. Super excited about this. I've been working on this for a year and a half before I even moved to Austin. This is the dream. So other than that, you can go to nosetotail.org and get all the great products there. I'll quickly mention our great stuff. We have the seasonings, we have the body care, we still have soap. We still have some of that great stuff in stock. We have all the meats I mentioned, plus more. We have bison, we have lamb. We've got the biltong. We've got the drovors, the stick version. We've got the one with liver in it, liverors. Best way to get grass-fed meat on the go. Get your organs in on the go in a delicious snack. You can also go to sapien.org, check out our program, check out the tribe. Lots of stuff going on there with Dr. Gary. And that's all for now. We got no sponsors, just my own company, which supports all the local ranchers and producers. So, nosetail.org, support the show, support the ranchers. And now a little bit more about my guest, Dr. Zoe. She's a researcher, author, blogger, and public speaker in the field of diet and health. Her areas of interest and expertise are public health, dietary guidelines, especially dietary fat, nutrition, and obesity. She regularly is interviewed on TV, radio, newspapers, and magazines. She has a BA and MA from Cambridge University in economics and math, as well as a PhD in public health nutrition. Her thesis title was An Examination of the Randomized Controlled Trial and Epidemiological Evidence for the Introduction of Dietary Fat Recommendations in 1977 and 1983, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. I'll give you a hint, there was not much that these guidelines were based on. And I've had many other guests talking about how bogus they are. She's so smart and so cool. We talk about so many great health topics, so I definitely catch this one and make sure you listen to the second half because she has a lot of strong opinions on what happened in the last two years. So. Check it out on the Food Lies YouTube. Check it out on any podcast app. Let me know what you think. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Just search for Food Lies. And enjoy this one with Zoe Harcomb, PhD. All right, we're back with Zoe Harcomb, PhD. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, thank you. It's so nice to see you again. Yes, it's been years. Zoe was one of my first 10 episodes, I think, way back in the single digits days four years ago. She had a very popular episode. People loved it. And now we're back for round two. And it's going to be even better. Yo. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. So I always say go back to the beginning too with this podcast. I don't try to just do random episodes with people just to fill space. I make them all good. 
And the podcast I did with Dr. Zoe years ago still holds up. So I would go back, listen from episode one, and let's get into it. So you're in Wales. You're up in the UK area. Oh, we are, yes. Yeah, Wales. Uh, over the last couple of years with all this nonsense, Wales, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland has become really... Um, we've understood for the first time that we're different countries. We're just part of the mm. UK because everyone decided to have their own corona regulations and we're quite close to the border with England. So we'd have rules in Wales and then you tra travel five miles and you've got different rules. It's been an insane two years in many ways. It's been especially insane for us living on the England-Wales border. It's just mm. been mad. Well, I want to get into that stuff. We'll save that for later. Okay. Um, <laughs> my crowd is is not buying into this all and they see kind of more going on than what should be going on. So um, we'll have to get into that later. But let's start with nutrition. We we should give people a background on you again. Your what your PhD is great. It kind of sums up a lot of what we want to talk about is how the <laughs> like, the dietary fat guidelines were not evidence based. Yeah, that's pretty much the title. Yeah, it's a systematic review and a meta analysis looking at randomized controlled trial evidence and epidemiological evidence coming to the conclusion that there was no evidence for the introduction of those dietary fat guidelines. And then I brought it up to date and said, okay, that was back in 1977, 1983. What if we looked at it today or today, 2016 was today when I was getting ready for my PhD finals. And is the evidence available here today after all these years? And the answer to that one was no as well. So there wasn't any evidence then, there isn't any evidence now. We've demonized fat during all of that time and the evidence has not been there to support it. And we've just gotten fatter and sicker since. Yeah. And the uptick really happens around 1977 to 83. 1980 yeah. is when they were formally introduced in the US and that's this sharp in uptick in the obesity curve in yeah. um, the US at least and around the world. Yeah. And that's that was exactly the rationale for my PhD because I was fascinated by obesity primarily. And I couldn't understand why we had an obesity problem because I've never met anyone who wants to be obese and you probably haven't either. So why do we have this massive problem? And if it really is as simple as just eat less, do more, then why wouldn't everyone do it? And then nobody would be obese and everybody would be happy. So to understand obesity, you've got to understand when did it take off? And as you say, there's just this inflection um, particularly on the American data, uh, it, there's just this sort of airplane taking off around 76 to 80 on that famous N. Haynes chart. And so you ask what happened then? And um, one of the things that happened then was that we changed our dietary guidelines. Now, that's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty big change to happen. And it at least, therefore, warrants an investigation um, and I'm open to somebody else saying that had nothing to do with it. This is the reason. But I haven't had that alternative view put forward yet. You know, people say, oh, we we've been eating too much. We've been doing too little. The data in the UK are the exact opposite. Our, our calorie intake has actually gone down since that time. Our activity has actually gone up. But what we've been eating has just changed dramatically. And it does reflect what we were told to stop eating and what we were told to start eating more of. So that's my number one theory until somebody comes up with something else to explain how, I don't know, two thirds of the world ended up overweight and one third obese. It's so good. What we're e eating, what we're eating changed. The genetics didn't change. Yeah. The air quality didn't all of a sudden change. The water quality, you know, there's people have all these different ideas for what happened. And yeah. actually, I'm working on this part of the film right now, which is now a six part series. And we do we go to this great length to show why what you're eating matters the most. And I love the kind of Gary Tobbs. I think we have him in this saying, did everyone just become lazy all of a sudden around 1980 and stop, you know, didn't eat less and move more at that time? Like It doesn't make any sense, right? The only thing that makes sense, like you said, is that the change in what we're eating. So that's yeah. what we're going to get into today. So maybe we could even just start it off with the calorie stuff. I love debunking <laughs> calories in, calories out, <laughs> because <laughs> it really explains why what kind of calories you eat matter, not the amount. God, where do we start with that one? Um, I mean, we could start in so many places. One one is just with the basic theory, and I kind of always start there. So the 
one pound equals three and a half thousand calories to lose one pound you've got to create a deficit of three and a half thousand calories which is where people get the idea that they should cut back by a thousand calories a day because then over seven days you've created a seven thousand calorie deficit and you will have lost two pounds by the end of the week and everyone who's ever tried that knows that it doesn't happen Um, And I joke at conferences, I say I weigh about 110 pounds. If I did that over the year and I eat quite a lot, so I like to think I could cut back by a thousand calories, I should weigh six pounds Mm -hmm. in a year's time. Actually, I should weigh minus because that's just the fat that you're supposed to lose. You're supposed to lose more on top in terms of water and lean tissue. Um, So I should have become zero weight at about 10 months or something. And then everyone laughs and I say, why are you laughing? Because most of you buy into this or you have bought into it in the past. I did as a teenager. Um, You know, I'm glad I I got it over with as a teen. And I didn't. There's some people in their 60s, 70s who still think if they can cut calories, they can lose weight. So, you know, at least I worked it out really early on. Um, It just doesn't work. And there are so many reasons why it doesn't work. Um, The the one pound equals three and a half thousand calories for a start is wrong. Um, that that's one of the fundamentals that we've got wrong. And it's really important. I played with some numbers. You go back to where did that number come from? You can trace it back to academic articles somewhere around the 1900s. If you go on my site, zoeharkham.com and put in three and a half thousand as a number, it will bring up this article that just says, look, prove it or lose it, prove it or stop using it. And it goes through the numbers. Um, and if For example, they think some fats have got eight and a half calories and some have got 9.4 and they average them out at nine. And hey, that shouldn't really matter. And I show that over a year, if you believe that three and a half thousand calorie theory, it will matter to the tune of up to two stone, um, which is 28 28 pounds pounds, Yeah, yeah, to to, to Americans. Um, And that's pretty serious. You know, I don't want to lose 28 pounds or gain 28 pounds just because you got your frigging formula wrong. Um, (laughs) But that's kind of where you're at on the basics of the calorie theory then you can approach it from a kind of that whole if you just eat less and or do more to the tune of a certain number of calories your body is just going to give up fat like it's a cash machine oh you've got a deficit of of you know 100 calories there you go i'm just going to give up that amount of fat like it is some cash machine you can just put your card in that is so utterly ridiculous again where do you even start with that one um the body is hardwired not to do that so the body is just going to adjust Um, first thing the body's going to do, if you try to eat less and or do more, the body's going to try to get you to eat more and or do less. Mm -hmm. It's just going to immediately try to stop you doing what you're trying to do. And there are uh, well-known studies. I mean, if you look at a great study in the UK, the early bird diabetes study run by a team in Plymouth, and they showed that basically people do the same kind of level of activity. They, They did it on kids and they said, okay, there's some kids that go to a really posh school And they've got rugby and they've got lacrosse and they've got hockey and they've got loads of exercise scheduled. And then these kids that go to a really poor school and they don't really have a playing field. So they're not doing rugby and lacrosse and all the rest of it. And God, they're kicking around in the playground. Um, But they do the same amount of activity throughout the day because the posh kids get home and just sit on the sofa and do their homework or do nothing. And the poorer kids go home and they go out in the street and they get their bike and they kick around on a skateboard and they meet their friends on the street corner and they wander off somewhere and they get into trouble. They do the same amount of activity at the end of the day. So if you go to the gym, you'll find you get home and you're too tired to do the cleaning or the ironing or the gardening or, you know, play with the kids. Um, So your, your body just adjusts. And your body will adjust on the food. Now, if it can't get you to eat more, let's say, I mean, it will get you to just think about food the whole day long. You know, if you and I started a thousand calorie a day diet tomorrow, guaranteed by mid-morning, we're craving food. Now, we're quite strong individuals. If we can overcome that and just say, right, I'm not giving into it. I'm just going to go with that hunger. Then before long, the body is just going to adjust down. So the body's going to be getting us to do even less. Don't go to the gym because you just haven't got the energy to go to the gym. Um, And then it will start shutting off things in the body. And that doesn't take very long. So women, I mean, Savannah and I talked about this, women, periods can go in a few weeks. That's the entire reproductive system just turned off by the body. How many calories did that need? I don't know, but they're not needed anymore. So you just reduced your caloric intake. You get cold the whole time. So your body is basically turned off the heating system. You get this sort of puffy... Um, you just look unwell if you see a real serious calorie counter and and you eat a lot of carbs when you count calories because you need to get the biggest bang for the buck. 
Um, so you won't eat fat. So you're eating rice cakes and fruit and stuff with zero fat. You just do. Um, so, you know, all these bad things, you just set off this whole cascade of bad things that starts acting against you. Um, your body doesn't build bone density. Your body doesn't fight infection. You go down with colds, you get flu. Everything just stops. You know, the idea that the body's just going to stay exactly as it is and you put in less and or try to get it to do more and it will just give up the body fat that you want it to give up. It's quite possibly one of the most stupid things that anyone ever believes. It's just nuts. It It, it is wild. And people argue about it online for decades. <laughs> and I've, I've been part of that discussion and argument and I, and it's, it's hard to break it down because, you know, you need to get into all these details. So how do people lose fat, right? You want to lose fat. And we separate this in the film too, because there is studies that show if you just don't eat enough protein and you're eating, that's what happens when you just count calories. You're just, Oh, I'm just going to cut calories. These people lost muscle mass and you yeah. lose bone density. So yes, you don't want to lose muscle. And a lot of people, people go on a juice fast, they're just going to lose muscle mass and yeah. right, lean body tissue, bone density, just water weight maybe. So how do you do it properly, which is a okay. big question. Yeah. So I mean, the caveat that we probably should have said is in the very short term on a calorie controlled diet, particularly your first one, you will lose weight. Um, but if you look at the studies, things like Franz 2007 did a review of 26 different weight loss studies, brilliant study. What you tend to see is that about six months, you start regaining weight, which is what happened with the Minnesota starvation experiment, the Ansel Keys, the really good experiment. Um, so you will lose weight in the short term. So if somebody comes and says, oh, but I lost weight on a calorie control diet, you will, particularly your first one, and you will up until about six months, and then you start this regain, and it seems pretty inevitable, and then you're back where you were, and you then start going above your original baseline. Because as you say, you've lost muscle mass, which was actually burning calories for you. It's um, working for you. It's helping exactly, you. And you got exactly, rid of it. Exactly. So you actually, you start off on, let's keep the math simple. You start off on a baseline of 2,000 calories. You cut back to 1,000. You will then start gaining weight, probably around 1,500 calories. So you certainly won't be able to get back to anywhere like eight, 1,800 in the short term. So you then have to live with hunger for a long period of time. And of course, people can't do that. So part of the weight regain is that you're going to regain at a lower calorie intake. And part of it is that you just can't sustain the hunger any longer. And part of it is that you've lost the lean tissue that was working for you. So all of that, you, you just need to say it's going to do something in the short term, but just don't go that route because it's going to mess you up really big time at about six months. So how do you lose body fat? You have to have the right circumstances for the body to lose body fat. And, and you know this, so we're just saying this for your guys. Um, you have to have no other fuel present because what you actually want is for your body to break down body fat. And in this circumstance, we're talking about breaking down triglyceride. Try as soon as you see the word try, you thinking three. And basically the structure of body fat is a backbone of glycerol with three fats attached to it, three triglycerides. And that's breaking down that is actually what breaking down body fat is. And that is what losing weight is. If you're not breaking down body fat, you're not losing weight. So under what circumstances can your body do that? It won't necessarily, but under what circumstances can it do that? One, you don't have other fuel available. So if you've just eaten some pasta, you've got other fuel available. If you ate pasta within the last 24 hours and it's still in your glucose storage room being stored as glycogen, you've got other fuel available. If you're continually drip feeding carbs because you're a low fat calorie counter, you've got other fuel available. So in those circumstances, you've got no need to break down that body fat. So any other fuel available, it's not going to happen. Insulin present, it's not going to happen. And that's one of the things that sometimes the sort of the, the bodybuilders um, don't sort of appreciate quite as much as, as they should. And we, we talked before this about the work of Ben Bickman. I mean, Ben is just brilliant. Um, and we need to, to make sure that people know that protein has an impact on insulin. Protein doesn't really have an impact on glucose. If you're in a blood glucose monitor and you have some white fish or a chicken skinless breast, it approximates to pure protein. It's not going to do anything to the glucose meter, but you are going to register with insulin. 
protein does have an impact on insulin. So if you've got insulin present, to be able to break down that body fat, you need the operation of the hormone called glucagon. And of course, insulin and glucagon are equal and opposite. They're antagonists. If one is doing something, the other isn't doing something. So for as long as you've got insulin in play, glucagon is not in play. So quite simply, you've got to have no other fuel available and you've got to have insulin not present. So you didn't just eat a skinless chicken breast thinking I avoided carbs, I avoided fat, I did myself a great favor. Now in those circumstances, if the body then needs fuel, the body has the opportunity to go and break down body fat. It's got the right physiological state. Now that typically happens in the middle of the night. So a lot of our weight loss is actually fairly effortless. If we have a reasonably low carb diet or we match our energy usage so that we're using up the carbs so that by about the time that we're going to bed, we're not going to bed with a full glucose glycogen larder. At some point in the night, our blood glucose levels are going to drop and the body is going to say, go and break down some body fat because the glycerol can help get the bloodstream back to normal. And then you've got some triglycerides in the bloodstream to use for fuel as well. Um, and, and that's the easiest time to lose weight. We should be losing weight while we're sleeping. What a great, what a great double bonus. Oh, sounds Sleep like a great weight. It sounds like a great advertising scheme. Yeah, like a marketing plan for a diet. But it's true. It's true. It's you, you need to find times for your body to burn its own fat. Like if you're looking agnostic of diet, like we're going to narrow down into how to do that. <laughs> but you, at the basic fundamental level, you need to find times where you're not producing insulin, where you have low enough energy where you can use your stored body energy. And that's, I mean, that's just simple. And there's many diets that can help you do this. And some, like you said, can just do it in the short term. Some people can white knuckle it, right? I love saying that. It's like people can do anything. They're like, yeah, I went on a Twinkie diet, right? There's that <laughs> professor that did a Twinkie diet. And no one thinks that's healthy, but it's like, yes, if you manage, if you have enough willpower, you could cause your body havoc and lose weight in a, in a short term by just eating 1,400 calories of Twinkies, I think it was. But that, that, that's just an absurd thing to do. What you need to do is get enough protein and nutrients to supply your body with what it needs yeah. while also letting it burn its own body fat. So that, so yeah, we can get into the, how to do that even more because you said, you, you talked about some nuances already about matching the level of carbs to your energy output, right? Because some people are like, oh, well, I'm, okay, I'm not in the carbs are bad camp. Maybe I was back when I interviewed you four years ago. <laughs> Maybe I was more, I think I was a little more um, keto, low carb focused, but now I'm kind of looking at all the ways that work and that you can have diets that have more carbs in them if you're eating the right kind of carbs or eating them the right way, which is what you're talking about. So if you, people will say, oh, but you know, I know this guy who eats tons of carbs, but he lost weight. It's like, yeah, the bodybuilder guy that's in the gym for two hours <laughs> or the marathon guy yeah. like Tim Noakes, who was one of my single digit interviews that got pre-diabetes and got all these health problems while eating carbs and staying thin. Yeah. So let's jump into the, yes, the next level down of, you know, how to, you know, what to eat yeah. and, and so how I'm, to do it strategically. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm not particularly low carb either. So when I go to conferences, I've always been sort of the higher carb person in the room. I remember being at a conference with Steve Finney. Um, it was the Noakes conference down in South Africa in 2015. And I love fruit. And you're down at a buffet restaurant and you've paid 20 quid for your buffet. So you, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to have everything, the scrambled eggs, the fruit, you know, everything. And I remember just turning up for my first plate, which is a plate of fruit, which you don't get in Wales. And it was melons and tropical fruits and pineapples, really high carb fruits and he kind of took one look and he said well if you could why wouldn't you and I thought that was really quite an interesting comment as in I'm not overweight I'm not diabetic he at that time had type 2 diabetes so he was managing his type 2 diabetes with diet and kind of you know if you can get away with that then why wouldn't you kind of thing and I thought that was a really nice way of acknowledging that we're all different and if we can get away with it and we don't get away with it too much so we don't end up like Tim Noakes then it's okay now, I still think the easiest way to lose weight is to cut the carbs, because if you think of those two physiological states, what is most likely to make sure you don't have carbs in the storeroom, cutting carbs, and what is most likely to make sure that you don't have insulin present, cutting carbs. Um, what is the one macronutrient that we don't need? Carbs. There is no essential carbohydrate whatsoever. 
Um, and a lot of people, I think with a weight problem, I, I've worked a lot with, with people with weight problems over the years, and a lot of them, quite frankly, feel addicted to carbs. And for many of those, it's actually easier to cut them really right down than it is to, to try to eat them in moderation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll find that they'll cut out whole food groups that are carby. So they'll cut out refined carbs, clearly, that's not going to help. But they might cut out bread, even if it's sourdough and it feels like healthy bread. They might even cut out grains, even if it's brown rice and whole wheat pasta and that kind of thing. Because for them, if they have pasta or brown rice, they just want more of it. And they've recognized that that's not going to help them get achieve their weight loss goals. Um, so for a lot of people, they're not worried about carbs with things like dairy, milk, yogurt, berries, Um, even some of the the beans and pulses, you know, if they're having a chili, they won't worry if it's got some kidney beans in it. Um, But they do stay away from whole carby food groups. And I think that's a good idea. I mean, it's just, it's the one that makes sense to cut if you're trying to lose weight. Okay, I'll jump in real quick, because I I agree. So I'm always trying to straddle all the lines. And maybe the audience isn't I, I lose some of my audience all the time because everyone's like, I'm a carnivore. Like I, if this guy talks about anything that's not carnivore, I'm out. And then the other people, there's like this whole pro metabolic side, people who are finding out <clears throat> how to eat carbs in a healthy way. And they'll be eating fruit. They'll be eating whole food carbs. They'll be eating fruit and potatoes and different things like that. And they have found a way to make it work for them. And so they kind of are disproving that it's, it's possible to stay healthy eating it if they do it correctly. But what I wanted to jump in and say is that cutting carbs is just, just such a great intervention and that I think it could be the first line of defense kind of in that I, for all the reasons you said, it's so effective, especially even with the food addiction and mental side, it's just easier to do. So I always will support that. And I went on my journey and cut a lot of those foods you said, the carby processed foods, the mm-hmm. bread, all that stuff had an amazing, you know, reset and just different, um, fat burning metabolism and getting into that mode. And now I can come back and eat fruit and, you know, honey and stuff like that, because I'm doing it in a more thoughtful way. And I went through that whole body change and fat adaptation and just, Mm -hmm. I mean, entirely kind of making myself metabolically flexible. So great option. You said something really important there, which, which was about what works for you. And I think, People have got to find something that works for them. And we are all different. And we we got too prescriptive in this world. It's kind of, unless you're doing keto or unless you're doing, you know, then it became even more extreme. No, you can't do keto. You've got to do carnivore. We don't have to be that extreme. You know, the, the, the basic premise should be eat real food. Um, and then you can move on from that point of view. So, so my sort of three principles are number one, eat real food. Number two, choose that real food for the nutrients it provides, which then drives you towards eating the fat proteins, not the carby stuff, because that's where you find the nutrients. And then eat a maximum. So the fat proteins are the animal foods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got this sort of little diagram on my website. I think I've I've got a um, what should we eat um, post. And there's a diagram that I developed to use at conferences. And it's sort of, you know, over on one side, you've got pure carbohydrates. And there's there's only one of those basically, which is sugar and honey is also a sugar. So it falls into that category. And then at the other side, you've got pure fats um, and they can be um, olive oil, coconut oil. They, they tend to be your oils, um, not even sort of lard, which is pig fat, because lard will, will sometimes have other bits in it because it's the thing that comes from the pig and the pig has also got protein in it. Um, then when you look at sort of how nature provides fat proteins, they're the things that vegans don't eat. So they're your animal food. So they're your meat, fish, eggs, and dairy. But then nature tends to provide carb proteins, which are the things that vegans do eat. So they're the grains, beans, pulses, vegetables, fruits, um, and things like most non-starchy vegetables are such that, you know, they're practically water with some nutrients in them. So they're, they're, they're nothing really to worry about. But the big starchy items like tropical fruits, um, starchy vegetables, potatoes, tubers, grains, and beans and pulses are pretty starchy. Those are your sort of carb protein based foods. Now, if you, if you look at those separately, I mean, first of all, I found it really interesting that nature separates them and it's really only nuts that's in the middle that's got carb, fat, and protein all in good measure, which I just find fascinating. So the food manufacturers, their modus operandi is fat and carb in the same food 
every food we can't resist has got fat and carb in mm-hmm. the same food. Nature doesn't do that. Nature puts carb proteins or fat proteins with the exception of nuts. And nuts is the only food that I, the only real food that I can't eat in moderation. So if you put me in front of a bowl of cashew nuts and I start, they'll, they'll be gone. Um, and I'm sure that's because of the fat carb combo, which is the, the, the realm of the processed food. But the nutrients are in the fat proteins. If you choose your food for the nutrients that it provides, you choose red meat, oily fish, eggs, especially the yolks, dairy, especially full fat. And so you will naturally move away from a high carb diet. And then the eating a maximum of three times a day. The other really bad thing that you do when you're calorie counting, because you're hungry the whole time, you graze. So you have an apple here and a rice cake there and a piece of dry Melba toast somewhere else and a low fat muffin. And you just graze the whole day long. You never allow your body to get into that physiological state where it can burn body fat. Um, it, It just doesn't happen. So maximum of three times a day. But within that kind of framework, some people are going to find they just get on with carnivore. And that's never going to work for me. Keto isn't going to work for me. Um, I would feel miserable and deprived if I couldn't have milk, yogurt, berries. And, you know, I went out last Wednesday and had brown rice risotto or whatever, you know, probably 400 grams of carb in the one meal. I want to be able to have that. I want ice cream if I'm on holiday or whatever. I'm that's what works for me. And somebody else will fail on their diet if they can't integrate something that they need to integrate that works for them. And it's such a delicate balance between I need to have that because then I'm going to be able to stick to the diet and I'm going to feel I'm okay and I'm addicted to that. So I'm not letting it go. And I'm just then going to end up eating more and more of it. So you've really got to be honest with yourself and a bit of trial and error And if you're trying to kid yourself, you can have a scoop of ice cream after every dinner and then you're having two and three scoops or whatever. It's not working for you. So that needs to go. Um, But but people need to be bolder in this field of write it down. Just what do I need from a diet? What is the minimum I'm going to be able to get away with? But this is my goal. I'm going to have to make sacrifices to get to my goal. That's, you know, you don't get something for nothing. What's the minimum sacrifice that I can make to to get to my goal? Um, and, and be more individual because we are all different. Fasting works for some people. Um, it doesn't work for me. It might work for you, but find out. I, I agree. I agree with this. There's so much. Yeah, even fasting. I think you and I have maybe our metabolism is too fast. We're we're sort of naturally slender people, and I, I just I've never fasted over 24 hours. It's just not not my me thing. Too. Yeah. But um, yeah, you need to find out if you're an abstainer or a moderator. Yeah, some people. They can moderate. I can moderate. I have ice cream. Yeah. Yeah, Who cares? Uh, I I play I play volleyball for five and a half, uh, four and a half hours last weekend. I had some ice cream after. (laughs) Of course. You need it after that. Of course. I need it. Yes. I need to fill up my glycogen stores and I I earned it, I'd say. But then I don't think about ice cream during the week. And yeah, I don't think about alcohol during the week. I don't think about anything you know, really during the week, except for just work and eating well. And, and then, you know, on the weekends, I, I loosen up and, and that's what works for me. Some people, I get it. Yeah. Like you don't tell an alcoholic to just say, Oh, just have a couple. Some people need to abstain. That's fine. Learn, learn what you need to abstain, but just be, we can't, I don't know. You, you don't want to say demonize all carbs just because you have a problem with bread and chips and candy. It's yeah. like, well, Maybe you can work towards eating the fruit for dessert after you eat a whole bunch of protein and fat and you're satiated and you get the nutrients. Then you also have a less blood sugar response to that fruit after the protein and fat. So yeah, we have, you have a little, you know, strawberries and the yogurt after dinner and you can do okay. So yeah, so much good stuff there. Actually, there's one more good thing um, we talked about is eat, eat for protein and nutrients. I say protein and nutrients. And all the foods you listed, your fat protein foods, those are the animal foods. And also they have such a higher ratio of protein and nutrients compared to the energy, which is the fat. When you look at the other group, you're talking about the carb protein group. There's not a lot of protein in that group. No. You know, it's like there's not a lot of protein in, in even beans. Beans are supposed to be the best protein source for, you know, vegans, all that. If you look at the protein to fat ratio, it's not great. You get the yeah. best protein and nutrients from animal foods. So maybe you can elaborate a little on that. 
Yeah, and it's not complete either. So again, on my website, I did something last year, I think it was, where I'd seen something on Twitter where some um, society or something had put out, oh, you know, look at the value in chickpeas. They've got more protein than an egg or something. And it's like, that is such BS. So I just have to look at that straight away. Um, And I really got it down into the amino acid level. And the reason that we describe animal foods as providing complete protein and plant foods as providing incomplete protein is because the plant foods are incomplete. When you look at the essential amino acids, and of course, essential in nutrition means something that we must consume. It doesn't mean something that we must get. It means something that we must consume. Um, So we have to get it in our diet. The body won't make it. So, for example, cholesterol is essential, but the body makes it. So we don't actually have to eat it. But protein, the essential amino acids, essential fats, um, those essential nutrients we need to consume. And in plant foods, they don't come in the right ratios, in the right proportions. So when you really drill it down, there are some plant foods that get quite close. So things like chickpeas might get quite close. Lentils might get quite close but they don't have all the things that you need in all the ratios that you need them. So they they actually have specified measures of the amount of amino acid that you need per gram of food, 100 grams of food or whatever. And then it's really simple. There's a bar across. And if that food is providing the right amount of that particular amino acid, then it, it meets the bar. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And plant foods don't meet all the bars. I'm trying to remember. I think it's loose lysine or something. Lucine, the, definitely yeah, the, lucine. The, yeah. The one that they just... Which you need for muscle building. Exactly. Lucine which is, they, yeah. they just miss. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why they say, well, you've got to combine plant foods. So if you look at... Um, if you look at national dishes that are traditionally vegetarian, so if you think about the Mexican, um, some of their traditional dishes, so they would have um, a sort of black bean dip with nachos, you'll find that there's some... Uh, protein in the corn and there's some protein in the beans and perhaps if you put the two together you're making up a little bit for what you missed in one but nobody knows how to do this you know you stop your average vegan in the street and say so how are you food combining to get your essential amino acids they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about and it's just kind of oh you know plant foods must be healthier so if I just eat plant foods everything is going to be okay (laughs) it's like beans and rice beans and rice is a classic one and I always say, yes, maybe you can almost get the cor- the correct protein with beans and rice, but how many calories are you getting for that yeah, protein? Yeah. You're getting way more. Yeah, yeah. And whereas you could have salmon or red meat or liver um, and just get exactly what you need in maybe a couple of hundred calories of, of food, food product. I mean, I would eat more than that, but you'll get what you need in that kind of amount on a daily basis. So yeah, it's not the bang for the buck is really not good on plant foods. Yes. So when, and, and we do need to invoke some sort of caloric talk, right? I mean, maybe we, I wish there was a different word for it than calories, but yes, we do need to know how to eat less to let ourselves burn our own body fat. And that how is the hugest thing. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. You can't just tell someone to eat less and move more. That doesn't work. Counting calories doesn't work long-term, but what does work is figuring out what foods to eat so that it can allow you to burn body fat and and naturally eat less. And that's where you always come back to the animal foods because they're so nutrient dense. Yeah, I, I don't know that we actually have to eat less. We certainly don't have to aim to eat less. We're both agreed on that. If you aim mm-hmm. to eat less, you'd start making really bad choices. You do the wrong thing. You end up going down the wrong line. Um, there's something that I, if I do one more academic paper in my life, it's going to be to try to bottom this one out. And I'll try to do the numbers if I can here. So I use a female because it's probably simpler. So you've got a female, let's say she needs about 2000 calories a day, typical female who's moderately active, which is about one to three times a week, has most of her, call it energy needs in the form of basal metabolic rate. So let's say I'm that female, I'm only doing exercise three times a week. Um, and I need therefore approximately 1500 calories a day, approximately three quarters of my energy need is going to basal metabolic rate, which means if I'm ill in bed all day today, I still need 1500 calories because I've got to, you know, have my body doing all its basic things. We don't want systems closing down with a short term illness. Mm -hmm. It's still got to build bone density, keep muscles going, fight infection, keep the body systems moving and all the rest of it. Now, mostly 
the body wants fat and protein for basal metabolic repair. I mean, ideally, it wants the whole of that basal metabolic need provided by fat and protein. The bit that I don't know, and if any of your listeners know this, please do get in touch, is how much can carbohydrate contribute to that? Can it contribute any? Mm. Because that's going to be quite an important point. Because if it can't, then basically your body needs 1,500 calories of fat and protein every single day because that's to do the basic metabolic needs. Now, you've got those 500 calories on top, which is basically you're not ill in bed. You're this moderately active three times a week female who's going to work and picking the kids up and just doing other generally Mm -hmm. active things. But for the general activity, you only need 500 calorie energy units on top. Mm -hmm. Now, those 500 calorie units can be provided by either carbohydrate or fat. So where my mind goes to is the absolute upper intake need that you've got for an average person, because most people are only moderately active, is a quarter of your caloric intake. So it's about 500 calories a day. Now, any more than that that you're eating you've got the risk of them being stored as fat because you weren't going to use them up as energy. And let's say they can't contribute to your basal metabolic needs. That's the bit that I don't know, how much they can. So that is also the reason for me why you want to cut the carbohydrates. Because if you just cut that extra carbohydrate bit, if you're not having that 500 calories in fuel, and bearing in mind, if you're a bit over on your fat and protein, the fat part can go to fuel that activity, then you haven't got this carbohydrate store. You haven't, what people are doing is, particularly when they calorie count, they can end up having 1500 calories of their diet in the form of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And the body wanted 1500 calories in the form of fat and protein. So you didn't eat kind of the free 1500 calories that you could have eaten that actually your body wanted. You didn't eat those. Instead, you ate 1500 calories that your body didn't want that it can't really use to keep you Mm. healthy and, and keeping your muscle and all the other things intact. So that's why it's so much more for me about eating the right thing than it is about eating less. Because I think you don't have to worry that much about if I go the fat protein route, am I going to end up eating less? Because you're just going to be in that physiological state far more of the time that you are going to be needing fuel and your body will go and get it from a different fuel source, particularly in the middle of the night. Now, if you're gorging, um, you know, I got really mad with the keto world when they started saying, oh, you know, butter makes your pants fall down. Um, Mm. And I'd be sat next to someone at a conference who's, you know, 250 pounds and they'd be putting butter on their steak. Mm. And I'd say, if you don't mind me asking, why are you doing that? And they mm-hmm. say, oh, because, um, oh, I've got to get my fat ratio up. You know, <laughs> I've got to be 5% carbohydrate, you know, 15% protein and 80% fat kind of thing. So I add the fat to get the ratio. It's like, no, you cut the carbs to get the ratio right. You don't add the fat to get the ratio right. And then you wonder why you don't lose weight. So, you know, it's not about that. It's about it's about eating enough But I I really don't think you have to consciously or dramatically eat less. I I actually think when you start giving your body what it wants, which is the fat and protein, you don't keep putting this junk in all the time. So you're not eating the stuff that it's just got no use for. I think your body just starts performing better. Mm -hmm. And what then is to stop the person doing more? So you're not eating less. You know, I worked with a guy once um, who came around to the house and he said, oh, can I mow your lawn? And I'm like, yeah, great, thank you, but why? He said, I don't know, I just feel so energetic. I just feel so great with how I'm eating. It transformed his life. He said, I just feel I've got energy to burn. I'm like, you know, knock yourself out, do the ironing, do the, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you did four and a half, five hours of volleyball because you can. Yeah. You didn't do it because you're trying to lose weight. What can, what 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 might we do? How much more energetic might we just be as people? How much more alive might we, we feel just because we start eating what the body actually wants us to eat? You're so right on. And I, yeah, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have phrased it that way that we would naturally eat less, but I, I was trying to phrase it in a way that people understand that at some, you know, you're so right that especially the pro metabolic crowd, they're, yes. They're kind of proving that you can eat more and you can burn more calories if you get your body what it wants. Yeah. Yes. And it's, you have to get, this is the studies that I want. Yeah. You're talking about getting these studies to try to actually figure it out. This is, this stuff is so interesting. It's like, if you give your body the correct foods and, and you know, if you give them the correct fats and you're not getting a whole bunch of oxidized seed oils and you're not getting a whole bunch of refined 
carbs or like, you know, different things going on with the, with that, your body can work better. You'll have more energy. You'll burn more calories. You want to burn more calories. You want to have a higher metabolic rate. You want to have a higher body temperature. Like you said, people who, yeah, they're not getting who calorie restrict. Or I think if you do keto too long, you can get cold. You're talking about cold hands and feet. That I think that's that's a bad thing. That's your body kind of yeah, like shutting things down because it doesn't have enough energy. So so yeah, you that's what I'm saying. It's all about what you eat. If you give your body the right foods, then you I mean, yeah, I think I eat more actually. I think I eat more and it have much better body composition than before. When I was eating standard American food pyramid stuff, I was eating less and my body composition was worse. Now I'm eating more, but I'm giving it the right things. Yeah, that's the same with me. I eat so much better now. I eat so much more now and I'm slimmer than I was when I was trying to count calories. That's it. So it's it's the protein and nutrients and that's what matters and that's going to be coming from animal foods. So yeah. and okay. fat. Well, don't don't and say fat. protein all the and fat. Yeah, good fat soluble vitamins are really important. So, you know, with with protein for me, it's red meat is more nutritious than white meat and oily yes. fish is more nutritious than white fish and the egg yolks are more nutritious than the egg whites. So I kind of worry if we say protein, people start thinking skinless chicken breast. Said oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. You're For right. Protein and well, nutrients. I, I, I kind of group in those good fat soluble vitamins with nutrients, right? Brilliant. So yes, you're completely correct. And thank you for uh, putting that in because that's important. <laughs> nutrients, fat soluble vitamins and fat. So man, so many things. So the, the dietary guidelines, you wrote about the dietary guidelines. That's what led to, well, the food pyramid and eat well. I just think it's so hilarious. They call it the eat well plate. I heard you call it the eat badly plate. Eat badly plate. Yeah, I've heard someone else call it eat hell, which I thought was quite funny as well, actually. Um, oh, it's just so bad. It it's really so bad. Is. So that's what we've gotten. So I, I guess get into that for a second. This is just sort of the opposite. If you're looking at diet kind of scientifically, like we've been trying to do, like what does your body need? It's very clear that it's not what the food pyramid recommends or the eat well plate recommends. Yeah. It, I mean, it's just, just not. It's, it's not. If you, if you Google eat well plate, you'll get this diagram that comes up or I, it, I think it was eat well plate and then it became eat well guide, but same difference. Nothing really changed. And it's just beige food. So it's carbohydrates, it's cereals, it's pasta, it's grains. Um, you have to play spot the meat, spot the fish, um, spot oh, the egg. The corner. It's a little uh, bit it's, in the it's corner. It's so tiny. Even the and dairy. Yet they have this, no, yeah, going. the dairy's tiny and, and it's got to be low fat dairy, of course. And yet down in the bottom left of the of the latest one, the guide, they've got all this junk. So that it's like they can't resist still having it on the diagram. So one of the investigations that I did, and I had this published in the British, British Journal of Sports Medicine, was to say, who comes up with this? How can you possibly look at that and say that is a role model healthy eating diagram for the United Kingdom? And I found out, and this is when I really got into things like conflicts of interest, I found out that the body that's supposed to be responsible for public health in England is called public, it was called Public Health England. It's now got a really scary title. It's something like the Health um, Security Agency. Uh, since all of the COVID stuff, it's suddenly become about keeping us safe and secure, not just worrying about our health. I'm sure we'll get onto that. But anyway, Public Health England basically put together a body of about 11 people a couple of them were um, decent people, like a nurse or a dietitian or something, although the dietitians are conflicted. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, it was the Food and Drink Federation, the Institute of Grocery Distribution. It was representatives from major bodies that in turn represent all the fake food manufacturers. So if you put together a diagram of which companies were actually represented in either in by one of these reps, if not more of these reps, you basically had every fake food company that you could think of. So, you know, Costa, Starbucks, um, McDonald's, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, um, Cadbury's, Mars, Hershey. I mean, just the whole damn lot. Um, the grocery companies, everything fake food was represented on this body. And that was the body appointed by Public Health England, the so-called guardians of the public health for the whole England population. And then Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland, they just follow what England does when it comes to dietary advice. They're too lazy to put together their own plan. So the whole UK ends up with it. And it's basically the fake food industry set in our dietary guidelines. And then it gets worse because they then embed that eat badly plate in the school curriculum. 
So I had a look at the school curriculum. I can't remember off the top of my head, but by seven, let's say you're learning what the plate looks like. By eight, you're learning how um, to distinguish food groups on the plate. By nine or 10, you're learning how to get the sufficient portions that they recommend of all the different food groups on a daily basis. So they just embed it in our children's um, brainwashing. And we've got a, a, a Eat Real Food um, forum where we just help each other to um, overcome food addiction and stick to healthy eating and learn more about diet and health and dissect articles and meat isn't going to kill you and all that kind of thing. And some of the mums will say, you know, my child came home today saying, mummy, you're doing it all wrong. We shouldn't be having meat for dinner. We should be having more pasta and we should be having rice and pizza and pies and pastries and beige, 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 carb, carb, carb. And that's what they're being taught at school. And it's just horrific. Um, it really is like there's a conspiracy to make us fat and sick. They really don't seem to care that we are fat and sick. That's for sure. Uh, there's a question for you. Because I think they're, I mean, conspiracy theorists are just sort of like spoiler alerts of what's going to happen. <laughs> we're we're going to find out in a, a, you know six months or a year. I think we are actually, yeah. So, okay, so I posted about the NHS, the National Health oh, yeah. Service or whatever it is in, in the UK. I saw it. And they had a nutrition and hydration week. And you, I saw that you, I mean, you mentioned that you, you saw one of these photos. I, I screenshotted 10 of the photos. It was 10 photos. There was a whole donut cart. There was um, a milkshake, a milkshake thing and like waffles with syrup type of thing. There was candy. There was Kit Kat bars. There's fast food. There's just fried food. There was cupcakes, everything possible. This was and they were proud. So they have all these nurses smiling and they have the trays and trolleys and carts full of donuts and processed food and packaged foods. And this is for nutrition and hydration week. So this is when I was thinking, this is so bad, it's got to be on purpose. Like, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, I, I just can't figure out when we just laid out basic nutrition science, we know there's basic things that we know about food and what's healthy and not. not. You're talking about all the conflicts of interest and the big food companies being at the table. This is so bad that it's got to be something else going on. Yeah, and most people don't realize it. So most people don't know that Public Health England basically appointed the fake food industry, which is why it ended up as a journal article, because the journal like, wow, you know, we didn't know this kind of thing. Um, but it's still not generally known. If I, if I walked into the street in the UK and showed people that plate and said, have you seen it? They say yes, they've seen it in their doctor's surgeries, they've seen it in schools, they've seen it if they've been to any kind of clinic. Um, have you ever thought about it? No. Do you know who's behind it? No. Um, you know, my husband sort of says the way that the world seems to work at the moment is they want us to be in debt. They want us to be too busy servicing that debt to be thinking about anything else. Um, and they basically want us to be brainwashed with whatever it is that they're telling us. As long as you're watching Netflix and you're trying to work every other hour to pay your mortgage um, or to put food on the table or whatever – you're not questioning anything. So then anything can be happening at, at any kind of level. So the average person isn't aware and then it gets taught to their kids and it just gets reinforced through academic papers, which are all paid for by, um, you know, Eat Lancet as the diet. You look at the organizations behind that. There's three groups of organizations. One is big food. So they're the people whose products you're going to end up eating so they're happy. The other is big pharma you're going to end up sick and diabetic, so they're happy. And the other one is big agri-chemical. And the soil, if you don't have animals on it, is is going to be worthless. You know, we're, we're already at the point that we've hardly got any soil left. So very, very soon, they are actually going to be running our food supply because we aren't going to be able to grow food naturally. They're already growing food, up, food upside down in greenhouses that don't require soil. They've got the future mapped out. You know, they've got the, oh, we can genetically modify products um, then this sort of brave new world ways so that we can actually give you the food that we want you to be eating and we want you to be eating plants and we don't want you to be eating animals. And it really is like it's all mapped out at some top level. Um, what it what it isn't, I, I met somebody recently and we were, we were chatting about 9-11 and he's a, a military man and he's also a pilot. And um, we got onto 9-11 conspiracy theories. He said, okay, I don't I don't talk about conspiracy theories because that kind of, you know, some people glaze over. He said, but what I can talk about is what didn't happen. 
Um, so, you know, if you look at the angle of, of this going into this particular building or the fact that this particular building wasn't reported or that this happened and shouldn't have happened, I can tell you what didn't happen. I can tell you from an engineering, from a mathematical, because he's a mathematical engineer lecturer, I can tell you what didn't happen. So if we go back and do that for nutrition, you and I know we can tell you what didn't happen. They did not sit down at the public health body level, either the Dietary Guidelines for Americans or in the UK or New Zealand, Australia or anywhere else. They did not sit down and go back to first principles and say, what do humans need? They need essential proteins, essential fats, vitamins and minerals, and they need to consume them and they need, they need to get them in their diet. So where do we find those? Oh, look, we find them in red meat, oily fish, egg yolks, full fat dairy and some green things. And anything else is kind of an, an, an interest in extra is not core part of the diet. Therefore, we'll set dietary guidelines on that basis. Um, we will make sure that we don't support the fake food industry. We'll make sure that people realize that those foods are not great for you, that you shouldn't be having cereal. Sorry, Kellogg's, General Mills. You shouldn't be having cereals for breakfast. You should be having eggs, maybe ham, maybe yogurt, maybe berries or whatever. That's what they didn't do. So then you have to start asking, why didn't they do that? If they are the body responsible for the public health of the entire nation, why did they not do that? I don't know that they, and you, and you have to then start coming to the conclusion they don't want us healthy, maybe healthy minds. I mean, is it any coincidence that you and I are alert and awake and not sleepy and not dopey and not drugged up on carbohydrates? And we're thinking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. and or we're they not part of the system, but we're not on meds. I, I, I don't exactly. know your medical history, but I'm not, I'm not on medications. I, I don't nope. participate. I don't make any money for them. No, nope. I don't make any money for fake food apart from the odd little bit of ice cream every now and again. Um, nothing else in my diet is fake food. You know, there's all this worry about food shortages at the moment. Um, oh, you know, not being able to get fertilizer in this particular country or war, whatever is going to impact this. And then there's the domino and then you can't get eggs and da, da, da. It's like, you, you are going to be able to get eggs. You know, I know where my eggs come from. They come from the chickens down the road in the village. I know where my vegetables are going to come from. I know where my meat is going to come from, where my fish is going to come from. The fact that we're not going to be able to get crisps. Apparently there was a shortage of crisps in the UK. Um, before Christmas, don't bother me. We might not be able to get bread or pasta. Don't bother me. Cereals, don't bother me. Um, you know, and it shouldn't bother the average person. But my friend was in meltdown because she went into a supermarket and they said, you can only have two bags of crisps. We're rationing crisps. It's like, I'll, I'll go get some for you if you're that desperate. You can have my share. Oh, um, man. And those are chips for Americans. Chips, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the things that yeah, come yeah. out of the bag and, yeah, potato chips. Well, no, that, I think there is, I, I mean, oh man, I hate talking about the conspiracy stuff because it's not a conspiracy. This is just how the organization of society works. It's, you know, there, there are people at the top making rules. Like that's not a conspiracy. That's just what goes on. This is how society works. I kind of liken it to a preschool or there, there's these levels of hierarchy on all levels of society. Even back in the day, there was levels of, well, if you go to organization society, like the, the pharaohs and pyramids and slaves. It's like there's always this power dynamic or yeah. in the kings and the kings and then the, you have the peasants. You, you always have this power dynamic. And I say in society down to a preschool, it's like you have the preschoolers and then you have the teachers and then you have the principal. This is just how our society works. And the principal has to make rules. You know, he's trying to just manage the rugrats. Right. <laughs> That's all his job is, is to manage rugrats. And he's like, all right, give them some juice boxes and uh, some treats and a, a cupcake and a muffin. And they'll stop, they'll be quiet and, you know, stuff like that. They have to make decisions. They're not saying, oh man, I want to have the healthiest preschoolers ever. This principal doesn't care about the health. You know what I mean? Like, this is just one example. You could extend this anywhere, right? And it goes up the food but chain. That, that is such a good example, but it's such a mad example. Because if that principal understood about real food and took the sugar out of the school and got the children on water as their only hydration and real food as their own food, they would be so much easier to teach. That's a good point. Yeah. Because they, they go nuts. Down. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who worked with a school in West Wales. She said, are you prepared to do an experiment with, with me? Let's see what happens if we take sugar out of the school. Um, and of course, there's some resistance from some parents and some from some teachers and some board governors. But by and large, they bought into it. The behavior transformation in the school was immediate and stunning to the point that the teachers said, 
we don't want to bring the sugar back in because the kids are adorable. They're even energy, they're alert, they don't have this sugar high and then this crash. They don't get mad, rowdy. You know, just give a six-year-old a bag of Haribo or something and then watch them about one minute later. They go mental. What have you done to their little brains with all that glucose that's just been mm-hmm. piled in there? So this happened? What, what is this like? Can, did someone study this? Can we document yeah. this? What? Yeah. It, I, I mean, she didn't then go on and wrote an academic paper. Um, she's a local nutritionist that we've worked with doing a recipe book. So she just comes up with great real food recipes. And then we touched base with her and we said, hey, what are you working on a couple of years ago? And she said, I'm working with this school in my local area and we're just taking sugar out of the school. Um, and she just said, it's just been fantastically dramatic. It's like, you know, you're right. She should write it up. It should have been a prop. I mean, ideally it should have been a randomized controlled trial, right? Let's put those classes on no sugar and let's keep those classes on sugar. And then you can do it by a questionnaire and you can ask the children, how did you feel? You can ask the teachers, how did you feel? Ask the parents, how, how was your child when they came home from school? And that would be a, a, a proper, robust, randomized controlled trial. They didn't do that. They just said, look, let's give it a trial and see what happens. Um, but with my nieces, I mean, they're now 16, just turned 16 and 13. It's immediate. If they get hold of some sweets and eat them, they become little monsters still in about five minutes. And it lasts a while and then they crash and then they get hangry and grumpy and bitchy and just horrible. Mm. Well, I mean, maybe it could be a case report. You could write it up as a case report. Yeah. I just think we just need more things to point to because it's obvious to us because, you know, we know how this stuff works and we've seen it so many times with so many people, but we just need to let the world know about it. Yeah. But okay. So I'll go, I'll go on to my analogy. We're still, we'll talk about how the world works. I think the, I, th- I feel as like a rug rat to the people in power, right? That we are just the rugrats they're trying to manage and that they they just make these top-down decisions and it's not for our health. And yeah, they yeah, they want us in debt. They want us sort of just not healthy, sort of just relying on the system. I, I don't know. This just is obvious to most people I know. Like, you know, I post some of this stuff on Instagram or, you know, I like hint at it. And it seems like everyone's on the same page, especially in our world. And I know you're on the same page with a lot of this stuff. It's like, yeah, it seems like this is happening. And it seems like it for a reason. <laughs> yeah, the, the the whole sort of reason thing is, um, it, it's really become stark, hasn't it, over the last two years. And I think I, I have to try to find positives about the last two years because it's been such a horrific period in human history. You know, if I think about the negatives and I think about, the way we've just let people die alone and give birth alone and we've isolated people. And I've been reading this Julius Ruchel book recently and he talks about the average length of time in care home is about five months. Um, And we locked down for the best part of 18 months and and care homes to all intents and purposes, even though the UK is kind of back to normal, care homes still aren't. So you'll have had people in care homes for 18 months who will have died within those first five months. And let's say you've got somebody with dementia and then suddenly their family stopped going to visit them and they had no idea why. Just suddenly they feel completely unloved. Where's the few familiar faces that I still recognize? And then when somebody turns up at the window, when they're finally allowed to do that three months later, they don't even recognize who they are. And then a short while after they die and they die alone and the family know that they died, not even knowing that they cared about them. I mean, there are are stories that people are never going to be able to get over. Um, people are never going to be able to live with the fact that they lost a loved one in that kind of way, or they weren't at their partner's birth or their daughter's birth or something like that. The inhumanity that we have shown, and you've still got these people saying, oh, if this happened again, you know, the next virus, because we know there is going to be a next virus, thanks to Bill Gates, he's pretty much told us there's going to be one, Um, you know, the next virus, or we've just got to do more of this. We've got to do it sooner, faster, harder, stronger. Um, yeah, because it's really going well in New Zealand and Australia right now. But they they can't get out of this mindset of, oh, if only we just put more control and more draconian mes- measures. You know, the ones that we put in didn't work. So if only we'd made them more draconian, they would work kind of thing. If I start going to that place, I'd be a mess. So I have to look back and say, okay, what can we take that's been good from the last two years? I've made some amazing friends. 
I've lost some friends. Um, and then you have to sort of say, well, were they friends? Because friends should be able to overcome differences of opinion. Um, and I've been really impressed that they've been, the nutrition world has been a little bit split over this. And I tweeted something about, um, you know, a real friendship should survive a difference of opinion. And somebody who I've got a difference of opinion with on this whole COVID stuff phoned up. And I thought, you know, good on you. Um, that really is is saying, okay, let's test you put in your money where your mouth is. And I, I really still like this person. We just have completely different views on COVID. So that that's one positive. I guess the other positive is we've worked out who's awake. And you'll see this term on Instagram or on Twitter and people say, you know, wake up, folks, wake up. You've got to wake up because we are desperately trying to wake people up around us to say, you've got to come out of this carb induced processed food metabolic stupor where you're just, you know, waking up, going to work, earning the money, putting food on the table, going to sleep, waking up, going to work. You, you've got to break out of that cycle. That's the cycle that they want to keep you in. It's as if, it's as if the whole, from the moment you're born, it's as if it's just been arranged for us that we'll go to school until we're ideally 18, if not 23, or if certainly, you know, 16 at least, and then we'll get a job and the job won't pay quite enough so that we're constantly having to stay in that job so that we can put food on the table and a roof over our head. And you kind of want to just step back from it and say, guys, is this what we want for ourselves? Is We've got one chance at this life on earth. Is that what we want? Is that really how we want to spend? And then maybe you put enough away that you get to a retirement if you're lucky when you're 65 or something, and then your health isn't that great. So maybe you only enjoy a few years of retirement and then you die. You know, is that, is that it? And for a lot of people, it seems that that is it. And I don't think it's it because that's what they want it to be. I think that's it because they they bought into that's how it is. And what they don't want is for any of us to step back and say, is there an alternative? Is there a different thing we can do? Can we can we work for ourselves? Can we not work for other people? So that it's up to us the hours that we work and what do we do? Can we earn money in different ways? Can we work in communities in different ways? Can we be our own little community rather than everything at a national level? Can we behave differently? Can we be different kinds of people? And I think it's it's woken a lot of people up to the fact, particularly when you get into stuff like no jab, no job, it's then woken people up to, whoa, I don't want someone having that kind of power over me. I don't want my government saying, as happened in Wales, you can't go in a cinema or a theatre unless you've got some little thing on your phone that says, here's my health status um, mm, for all health. to see on a uh, yeah. Health, with yeah. H-E-L-T-H with the sarcastic <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's my medical intervention record on a government yeah. app yeah. that I am acquiescing to show to get into a cinema. And people are like, oh, it gives us our freedom back. And I just, I, 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 like, how can you be that stupid? Freedom was walking into the cinema. Freedom yeah. was what we used to have. You just walked into the cinema, you walked into the restaurant, you didn't wear a mask. You didn't have to have a, a medical intervention to do any of that. You just did it. And now you've fallen for the line that to get all of that back, you've got to acquiesce to whatever medical intervention the government want to impose on you, whether that's a mask, because that is a medical intervention. It's a non-pharmaceutical intervention or social distancing. That's a non-pharmaceutical intervention or staying at home or not going on public transport or closing schools. You know, those are all your non-pharmaceutical interventions. Or of course, there's the pharmaceutical ones which is they're lining up for jab four in the UK here at the moment. There's talk of jab five in the autumn. Um, and of course, if you're a good citizen, you'll just do that and then put it on your Twitter page and then put it on your app and then be happy to show it to get into a restaurant. And I'm really proud to say I have done zero bullshit over the last two years. I've done none of that. I have not, I've not had any passes. If someone doesn't want me to go in somewhere without showing that, I don't go there. I haven't been on holiday um, I don't like that I haven't been on holiday, but I, I like that I can sleep at night better than I, I've done what I've been true to mm. myself yeah. rather than, and that was more important to me than to not go on holiday. My neighbors think I'm mad. It's like, oh, you're cutting your nose off to spite your face. Um, I did what I wanted to do. You did what you wanted to do. I appreciate that. I'm so glad when people stand up for what they believe in. My sister's doing that. She still lives in California and is is standing up for what she believes in and having a really hard time from yeah. it. Really oh, hard time. We've, we've, we've had a hard time. I mean, don't get me wrong. There have been really dark periods over the last two years. There have been time when you've really feared how far they could go, how much 
you know, Austria um, in in Europe has been quite staggering, locking down people who refuse, specifically the people who refuse to have the intervention. Um, you can't go out for more than an hour a day. You can go out for mm. these reasons only. You can go for an emergency medical situation. You can go for food. You can't even go to work. Um, you can't earn a living if you're not prepared to succumb to this thing that the government has mandated that you should succumb to. And I'm just one of those people that as soon as somebody tells me that I must do something, I automatically wonder why. I automatically well, exactly. start. Well, this, this stuff isn't science-based. This is why I'm saying this is like the NHS and the Nutrition Week and it's all donuts. This is why <laughs> I know it's not, it's, it's not, it, there's something else going on here because it's not science-based at all. And this stuff I thought we were going to get out of this because there's so much evidence showing that lockdowns, all these things, different interventions don't work. I'm here in Texas. No one does any of that. There's yeah. no rules about it this whole time. So Florida lucky. too. There's not been rules. There's not been lockdowns. There's no vax mandates. There's none of that stuff. And we're doing better than yeah. most states. Yeah. I've looked at the data. Texas is doing better. Even I actually did a lot. I, I, I put a lot of the data out did a lot of um, analysis on all the different states and all the different things that happen. Um, it, it, well, their strategies for mitigation of the problem, as well as the health status of each state, right? So you look, you can look at type two diabetes rate, you can look at obesity rate, you can look at all these things. And what correlated most was type two diabetes and obesity yeah. for the rate of deaths per yeah. the state, right? The US is an interesting thing. We can have all the data of all the 50 states and see who did bad. Some states that were highly uh, <clears throat> um, populated, like New York and New Jersey, they did worse. And that kind of makes sense, right? And then some were really have an old population. Florida did a bit worse. But generally, you can see that it, it followed the line of the most obese and, and sick with the chronic disease states had the worst outcomes. Texas did better. They did better with zero lockdowns, zero mandates. We kind of outkicked our coverage because we do have some obese and sick people in Texas, but we did better than other states that were more obese and sick with no mandates, yeah. with yeah. none of this stuff. I, I love that you, the whole time. I, I didn't change my life one bit. I think that's how I, I, I haven't had a sore throat. I haven't coughed <laughs> once in two years. I didn't do a single thing. I didn't, I washed my hands less. I got into groups more. Mm. I found my people that wanted to hang out in small rooms from day one. I did zero things different in two years. And I, and I did a lot of that as well, but we were in areas that had restrictions. So a lot of that, you know, I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, did, did you move to Texas, by the way? Did you happen to be in I Texas? Did. Yeah, I did means, move to Texas because the world the was right falling down. Yeah. I was in California. They yeah. closed down the beach. I'm trying yeah. to play some beach volleyball. How am I healthy? Yeah. I played beach volleyball for four and a half hours out of the sun. Yeah. And they bulldozed the sand. So not only did they take down all the nets, they bulldozed the sand so you couldn't bring your own net. Oh, they created piles sake. of sand to block it. That's the day I decided I'm out. I was yeah. driving down the PCH, you know, Malibu, you know, that nice road. I could see all the piles of sand that my tax money paid. The bulldozers <laughs> that I paid for to block my volleyball nets. And I, I've been visiting Austin for six years. So I just yeah. was like, all right, it's time to move. Oh, good on you. I mean, we did actually even look at Texas at the beginning because we could see where things were going over here. And it's it just wasn't open to non to non um non Americans. I mean, basically mm -hmm. the States was closed for a long period of time. We kind of straddled the two countries. So my brother's in England, we've got a place in Wales. So when England was better than Wales, we could spend more time there when Wales Wales mm -hmm. wasn't better than England that much. Um, but by and large, I just didn't watch the news, didn't so if at any time someone had stopped me and said, What are the regulations right now? I'd have just said, you know, honest to God, I do not know. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't care. Um, I don't know and I don't care. I had COVID in February 2020. Um, I'm in the group that thinks once you've had it, you're not going to get it again. Um, I have had so many exposures to it over the last couple of years. If I had any chance of getting it again, I'm sure I would have had it again by now. Um, like you, I've, I've actively tried to be around other people because I actually believe in community germ spreading. It's mm -hmm. been what has kept human populations healthy over uh, forever. 
Um, and the you idea that your immune system, exactly. You have to do it and you have to do it from birth. Um, and it's all part of that is collective responsibility to me, actually sharing our germs and exposing each other to germs, protecting the vulnerable, sure, but exposing the general population to germs is all part of doing the right thing in a community. And then suddenly we decided that the exact opposite was the right thing to do. So I know a couple of children that were born in the summer of 2020. So they're about 18 months old now. And guess what? They're going down with everything. Mm. Because for the first few months of their life, the only people that they saw was mum and grandparents and grandparents if they were breaking the rules. Because for a lot of that time, you weren't even supposed to be out of your immediate family. Um, so they just didn't see anyone. They didn't go. They didn't go to coffee shops. Um, you know, normally you'd have people leaning over a pram, going, "Oh, baby, how cute!" Mm -hmm. Spilling germs onto the baby from mm -hmm. you know the second it's born, and baby just gets a snivel and a snivel and a snivel and just builds up immunity over eighteen months. They haven't done any of that. You know, we're gonna have a whole generation of sick children that's gonna trace back to the lockdowns. You know, before you even get into the mist cancer diagnoses, the heart incidences that have not been picked up, the mental health, the children's education. Uh, they're estimating in the UK now some children are at least a year behind um, where they should be in reading and all the rest of it. I mean, it's just been utterly catastrophic. But unless we have a decent post-mortem and we come to the conclusion that it's been catastrophic, we will repeat this. I mean, the thing that's going through at the moment, the World Health Organization, which is basically Bill Gates, are trying to mandate that every country in the world, this is going through in May this year, they want every country in the world signed up to the World Health Organization pandemic plan. If they get that, they release the next virus or oops, the next virus gets out. And immediately we go into World Health Organization implementation of plan. And it will be the worst that we've seen in any countries across the world implemented on a population wide basis. And maybe it's places like the US that will be okay because you have got this federal country kind of thing. You've got your state and your country. And it does mm -hmm. seem like some states have just been able to say, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that you might be the only place in the world that has got some kind of protection. The UK might get a mandate from the World Health Organization. Every country might be in lockstep. And we we might be in that kind of draconian. And then we just have to hope that enough people have woken up that they join those of us who didn't buy into this the first time and they just say, no, I'm not doing that because they, ha you know, we are the 99% as some people say, it's not that easy to control us. If we do get together and say, we're just not having this. We're not paying a hundred different taxes. We're not working every hour that we're awake just so that we can put a roof over our head. We're not having this. You know, if if there can be a great reset from this, but it's not the great reset that they want, but it's a great reset mm. that we want, which is we get more freedom, we get more work-life balance, we get more perspective, less consumerism, less you must have the next pair of trainers, you must have Coca-Cola, less of that and more of some real quality of life. This will have been worthwhile. If we don't get that, we're just going to repeat this whole nightmare again. Well, I don't think there's going to be a postmortem because they'll block it, they'll censor it, they'll call it conspiracy theory. So there's never going to be a satisfying look, a retrospective look at how destructive the lockdowns were and the mandates and all that. So I don't think we're ever going to get that satisfaction. I think most people uh, just go along with what the TV person says. But yeah, I don't know what to say because I know I have a community and I know you're part of that community that is awake to all this and they live well they know their ranchers they know where they get their food they you know, have community they have they just work outside the system so i always say that yes we're kind of just creating our own opt-out society and I, there there is a good thing to all this that it's yeah it's woken a lot of people up because I, I yeah i mean before this i just thought that the the health stuff was it i was like oh the food system's a lie and the pharmaceutical system lie and all this governments and then i was like oh i think there's more to it now <laughs> right and so then a lot of people in the health world they're all on the same page i don't know what health world you're talking about that's on in the same page because i'm seeing 99 percent of the people in my health world are very on the same page they know yeah, what's I, going I on i don't i don't want to name names but there's a couple <laughs> of people that i've been at conferences with there are that there's at least one big player in our world uh -huh. that has kind of cancelled me, cancelled Iver Cummins, 
So um, we're we're not one hundred percent on the page, but we're 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 pretty pretty much. If you if you woke up to nutrition, you, you've woken up to COVID because it's a public health issue. Yeah. Um, and then what got interesting, I think for me actually, I mean, I, I was probably a bit late to the party from some people, but I did a Monday note. I think it was back last October. And and in looking at it, I was looking at food and the environment and why do they keep saying we need to stop eating meat? Because without meat, we don't have the grazing animals. Without the grazing animals, we don't have topsoil. Without topsoil, we don't have the ability to produce food. You know, this is just insane. Mm -hmm. And started looking into it more and then started coming across things like land grabs and then Mm -hmm. started reading articles about that. And then I put something out on Twitter and it was kind of, oh, good to see you finally waking up. Start reading this. Start looking at this. Start looking at that. Um, and then at about the same time, the whole COVID enlightenment kind of, it had been going on for about six, six months. No, so it's, this is October 20. So it'd been going on for about six months then. That's the other thing. You lose track of time over the last mm-hmm. two years because they robbed us of two years. Yeah. So anyway, the big wake up was around October 20. And then at that point, I'm thinking this should be over by now. I mean, it was over in the spring of 2020. You look at all the data, it was over. Mm-hmm. what is going on why are they then saying we all need to have this jab why did it start off it's only the vulnerable people and then they want five to 11 year olds um it just kept not making sense why are so many different countries around the world doing exactly the same thing why did so many politicians just sort of seem to come out of nowhere um and then you you sort of start following down pathways and then you do come across the world economic forum you come across the great reset you come across them boasting that they've had this global leaders program and they've managed to get um all of these world leaders in place and you know obviously um Jacinda Ardern Trudeau Boris Johnson Angela Merkel the French guy Macron Spanish guy the Italian guy clearly the new Austrian chancellor and if the other one wasn't doing what they wanted they replaced that one you know the the way leaders have just been changed as well and then you realize they've got the IMF they've got the World Bank they've got the European Union um they've got people in heads of organizations they seem to have banks and it's all out there and people say oh you're conspiracy theorists I'm like no I'm looking at their website (laughs) I'm looking at their documents and their videos on their website And then I say to people, did you know Prince Charles tweeted this in June of 2020? Prince Charles tweeted, the Great Reset has been launched. And I'm the conspiracy theorist. You know, this is the future king of England telling us that the Great Reset has launched. Then you have to say, well, what is the Great Reset? And then they put this little wheel up. They're really helpful. It's like, here's a little diagram of what the Great Reset means to us. And we also call it the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it's about transhumanism, and it's about how we can have, you know, digitized humans and how that's going to work. And don't get me wrong, there's some good things. Um, Well, they disguise it as like, this is sustainable development. That's the word, you know, they always say that, yeah. And, And that's all part of the wheel. So if you look at the wheel, that's basically what they want to change. And there's nothing that isn't on that wheel. And then you suddenly realize how everything connects. So Google the Great Reset Wheel. And Mm. the food is just one spoke. I mean, there's something like 50 spokes or something. So food is just one. And transhumanism might be another one. And um, transgender is another one. So everybody's got to be whatever gender they want to be. And welcoming refugees um, is another one, you know, and then you start thinking, oh, you know, we're welcoming refugees into the UK at the moment. How, how and why is that happening? Um, and you start, things start making sense when you see all the different things that they're trying to, to do at the moment. And vaccines just seems to be central to absolutely everything for some reason. Um, and I'm trying to work out why that is. Um, you know, you look at the sustainable development goals for 2030, I think there's a 15 of them or something and 12 of them are about immunization. Why? How is that a sustainable development goal? What is that all about? Mm-hmm. Um, there's things that still don't make sense to me, but there's things that are starting to slot into place. And I think it's, as you say, that people need to realize that there is something else going on. It's not because I say something else is going on. Prince Charles is telling me that something oh, else is going on. It's Trudeau, all out there. It's all out there, but, but, but we're the ones that are called the conspiracy theorists. And I kind of want to say to them, look, okay, if it just if you don't prepare for anything, it's just going to pass you by, that's your problem. But it's not, it's our problem because we need enough people to wake up so that we 
become this resistance. We want the great awakening, not the great reset. Um, and if we have to do it one person at a time, you know, it's like the, the, the piece on the chessboard, isn't it? You know, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, 16, you know, so on. And that's what we need. If everybody can convert two people, suddenly we can reach the population in in a short period of time. Um, but we're not converting two people at the moment. You know, it's very slow to wake people up. No. Well, I'll tell you, this stuff goes a lot deeper than what we've talked about. I know a guy that's researched this stuff for 16 years. It goes back 100 years. I mean, yeah. the, you know, if you look at the World Economic Forum, that's just one little thing. Like, you can't look at anything in the past 10, 20 years. You need to go back to 1900, yeah. start looking at the, yeah, the formation of where all the money went. Just follow yeah. where all the money went and the power accumulation. And that that was not given up. Yeah. You know, that they, they accumulated so much power and money and control of financial system and the Federal Reserve and the education system, the media. That this was not just given up. And yeah, it, it, this is all out in the open. Just no one does the research. And it's all designed this way to make people think that we're conspiracy theorists. That's like part of the design yeah. or that you're plugged into the system. I can't talk to my brother about this because he's plugged into the system. He can't, if he acknowledges what I'm saying, it's going to ruin his life. Mm -hmm. His wife, is, he, he could get a divorce. I mean, she's not into it at all could get divorced, he could lose his job, all his coworkers will think he's an insane maniac. So it's this cognitive dissonance that he can't accept it. Yeah. Even though he's smart and he trusts me and he knows that I'm smart and all that, he can't listen to me because it would ruin his life. So it's, I'm saying it's designed this way and they, and they design it to marginalize people. It's like how quackery got started. They started marginalizing people, yeah. doctors who followed natural medicine yeah. And they they invent it. It's a it's a propaganda technique, and they called them quacks. It was a whole marketing campaign to make them look like they didn't know what they're doing to promote the surgeries and pills and the whole pharmaceutical industry. All this stuff you can look up, you can watch videos, you can read primary source information about. You know, don't take my word for it. There's just so much out there. I'm surprised um, <laughs> we got this deep into this discussion, <laughs> but uh, but you have to because. While I still love the nutrition and I still find it fascinating, there are many times that it just seems completely irrelevant right now. If, if, I mean, it's good that we eat the right way so that we've got the, you know, the freedom to think and we're not sort of duped um, and addicted um, because that keeps you out of this thinking cycle. But it's really quite irrelevant in terms of what really is going on and what could be happening. I mean, I, th I think you said right early in this, um, we're going to have more of an idea of this over the, the next six to 12 months. And I think we will. I, I think we will. I think we'll see, you know, there are people that still think that this has just all been about, there, there are either people who think all oh, the last two years they've kept us safe. They've done a really good job. You know, they just haven't looked at the data. Okay. That, that's one group of people. And then there's a group of people that think, okay, there's been something really weird going on and lockdowns didn't help but it was just incompetence. You know, they kind of, they went for an idea and then they just followed it through and they didn't want to come out and say, oh, we got it wrong. We shouldn't have locked down. So they just doubled down. And then they said, we've got to lock you down until we get the jab. And then the jab doesn't work. So we've got to lock you down until you have five jabs. You know, there, there's still a big group of people who don't think we did the right thing, but they think it's still incompetence. I must admit there's days I want to believe that. I'd love to believe that because it, it would be an alternative to what I think is really going on. But I can't because you can't have that level of incompetence so consistently across so many different countries in the world. It, they really did work in lockstep. And there is, you know, Google oh, lockstep. Go and find Operation out. lockstep. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I mean, find out what lockstep is all about. They worked in lockstep. Yeah. They threw out the World Health Organization pandemic plan from October 2019. All of them just abandoned it. And all of them went this crazy new route. And and it can't just be incompetence. It, I, I hope it is, but it, it just isn't. I'm sorry, guys. It just isn't. Where are we going to end up? I don't know. It really mm. does depend on how many people. And we haven't even got into the finances, which is a huge part of the Great Reset. And mm -hmm. um, you'll own nothing. You'll be happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want us um, renting cars. They want us renting clothes. They want us renting houses. They don't want us owning things. Um, it all sounds good. And yeah, it's like, oh yeah, you own nothing and be happy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the car just shows up and then you're like, wait a second. So then who owns everything? 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, who owns my house if I don't own my house? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and house buying. I mean, that's been a really big thing over in the US. They've been, you know, BlackRock is it who's been buying up houses like there's no tomorrow, so that it is more difficult for you guys to own your own house because mm-hmm. they've been buying them all up, and then suddenly you are renting to have a roof over your head from someone else, and the minute you're beholden to someone else, you're back in the system. Because then they can say no jab, no mortgage, no jab, no no rent, no jab, mm-hmm. no car. Um, you know, for as soon as you don't have that independence, they've got whatever control over you they want to have over us. And then you've got to go to why are they trying to do that? Why, you know, why why does it help the elite, the powerful, the people who own everything? Why does it help them to have us owning nothing and having knowing even less power than we have now? Well, it's just a rugrats. We're the rugrats and they're the principal. I'm telling you, that's just how the world has always worked. There's always this yeah. that same power dynamic, the pharaohs yeah. and the peasants. And so this all makes sense. So yeah, I'm glad you you kind of answered the question along the way. Why the coordinated attack against me? There's such an obvious worldwide coordinated attack against me. And it's just, this is just insane. It's yeah. like, you you know, audience knows, I know. Red meat's a health food. This is what we've always eaten. Why? So why would there be a coordinated attack? Like you can just know that this is very plain and simple, basic nutrition, basic, just biology, basic anthropology, basic everything. Yet there's a coordinated attack on it. That should wake people up. Why? Why would that happen? It's good for soil health. All it's good for everything. Yet there's a coordinated attack on it. Things don't happen. And the way the, the way that people just then follow that narrative. So people listen to the mainstream media. The media pushes out the message, meat causes cancer, meat will give you heart attacks, meat is going to kill you, despite that having zero sense, because it is our most ancient food. How can that be responsible for modern illness? It's that Peter Cleave quote. It's just ridiculous. But then you'll find people, Harvard, whatever, churning out paper, paper after paper. Repeating that nonsense, you've got organizations, universities in the UK doing exactly the same thing. You've got the mainstream newspapers repeating that. You'll bump into someone in the pub and they'll say, um, oh, we're eating less red meat. Or oh, why? Oh, because meat's bad for you. It's bad for the planet. Well, they just, they just, you know, captured all these people. They've just convinced them, wear a mask. It's the right thing to do. Don't eat meat. It's the right thing to do. Have your jab. It's the right thing to do. Guys, we've got to start thinking for ourselves. They are not doing this with our best interests at heart. And the minute you make that connection, that then you're likely to reject what comes next. But there are way more people than you and I. We are the minority, the ones who said, I'm sorry, I'm just not buying it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. But there are so many people out there who are not asking, does this make sense? Has this person has Justin Trudeau got Canadian citizens' best interest at heart? I don't think he has. Oh, yeah. Well, hopefully this woke up some people who were on the fence. A lot of people will just be feverishly nodding their heads the whole time <laughs> because they know exactly what we're talking about. Some people yeah. hopefully are woken up. Um, I'm glad you're kind of the voice of reason. Um, maybe it's just because you got your great accent. <laughs> and you, no, you got your PhD. You know, you're very smart. Oh, also, I'll throw in, this is not medical advice, YouTube, uh, by, we're not giving out any medical advice on here. And um, Yeah, don't eat yeah. red meat, because then it's more expensive for me and you. Like, don't eat uh, red meat, eat, eat lentils. That'd yeah, well, I, I just don't want to get another strike on YouTube. And oh, I'm probably God. setting off all kinds of alerts by even talking about it. But yeah, no, we're not no, no, giving no. out medical advice on no. here about... This is just our opinion. We're having a chat with friends. Yeah, yeah. so... I got to let you go. I've had a wonderful and... time here. It's been an hour and a half. Oh my God. Um, we could have gone all day. Well, I'll come back. Tell, tell me when there's, we'll come back and we'll see where we are in six months and see what oh. has actually happened. Absolutely. Yes. We'll my put forecast it on the... will be in a big financial mess some point this year. Uh, we are already, just people don't realize. Oh, there's going to be food shortages. You know, they, they call it out too. They're like, watch out for this. And then it, it magically happens. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll connect. Yeah. We'll, we'll for sure do this again Lovely. and maybe in the summer and the summer and we'll see what, what happened. Brilliant. Take care till then. All right. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye.